this talk is going to be on uh, red team operations. It's uh, about overt operations specifically. So when we talk about um, red team operations, the traditional context in which we think about these kind of things is that we want to not be caught, right? And so what this talk is going to do is we're going to get a bit of a deep dive into red teaming, but a specifically alternative strategy for red teaming. Because what I'm seeing with a lot of red teamers right now is that we have a decent number of hurdles and challenges to overcome because blue team defenses have gotten so much stronger over the past several years. And as a result, we've seen an explosion in red team tools and tactics, and also some rethinking of um, methodology that we maybe haven't uh, utilized or leveraged in the past. So we want to have a little bit of an overt versus covert discussion here. So first off, who am I uh, and why am I chatting with you? <laughs> well, my name is Matt Toussaint, and you can tell that I'm super cool by the shades. That uh, totally gives it away. And uh, I used to be in the Air Force. Uh, I used to be here working in San Antonio, actually, at uh, Lackland Air Force Base doing cyberspace stuff. Uh, eventually, I left the military, went worked with Black Hills Information Security for a while, doing uh, penetration testing, red teaming, all that kind of stuff. Swapped over to CounterHack for a little bit, building, um, you might notice these, these slides are SANS branded, uh, doing a little bit of uh, range building for SANS. Actually got to rediscover some of my military roots doing that, because we do uh, exercises to help with blue team uh, validation efforts for the CPTs that the military has, uh, some of them here out of San Antonio, in fact. Um, after that, I went ahead and made my own cybersecurity company, Open Security, uh, which, in fact, is part of why I'm chatting with you here today. We sponsored B-Sides, and they had a last-minute uh, cancellation for a talk, and they reached out to us, and I said, hey, uh, I happen to have some slides sitting around. Uh, I guess in a couple hours I can do a presentation for you. <laughs> so that's why I'm here, and that's why we're having this uh, conversation about overt and covert operations. In SANS, I'm also the uh, lead author of Sec Security 460 on Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Assessment, as well as the author of Sec 665, which you'll see at the very bottom of these slides, in fact, because it's where these slides come from, uh, on advanced red team uh, tactics and threat emulation. Now, if you haven't heard of 665 before, that's uh, partly by design, but it's also because the course isn't actually live yet. The course is in development. And one of the things that I want to do as we start developing this course for SANS and such is I want to share as much as we can with the community as we go through, which is the genesis of these slides. So what you're seeing here is essentially a bit of a beta first look at some of the things that we're exploring from the perspective of red team training. And I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, so this presentation here is focused entirely on red force versus blue force operations. And that what I mean by that is you've got a red team, you've got a blue team, and they interact with each other on a networking environment. And traditionally, of course, when we talk about it from the red team perspective, we want to challenge the blue team. Our objective in the end is going to be to make blue team defenses stronger. And there's a good reason for this. Right now, I would not say that we are winning in cyberspace. Not really. And the thing is, it's not because we have to lose or because the attacker has the advantage. I think once we're through this conversation and through this topic, you'll see that the attacker really doesn't have the advantage. Since we're giving it from the perspective of red team, we can actually see the history of this and why, as red teamers, we today perhaps need to very significantly alter the site picture by which we actually look at how we perform operations in order to keep up with the most advanced blue teams out there. But the problem that we have, and the reason why we're not really winning, is because many blue teams aren't focusing on what is, in fact, the right problem. And what we see as a result of that is that attackers have essentially carte blanche access to our information networks and information systems. Uh, with open security, we do all kinds of cybersecurity work, things like penetration testing and red teaming, but also incident handling and incident response. And uh, for example, I was doing an incident response. Uh, you tend to have to do these on site. So this is the last incident response I did before all the quarantine lockdowns and COVID-19 stuff. So, ah, fun times. So I was doing this incident response, and it was for a law firm who had been compromised and ransomed. This was in February. And uh, so we go in there, and we first start looking. And what we want to find out is how the attacker got in, potentially do some attribution to determine who that actual attacker is. If this environment got compromised, by our experience, we can pretty much say that it's probably not the most secure of environments. Um, and not to say that if you're really secure, you won't get compromised. That's not the case at all. But generally speaking, if I'm showing up to do incident response, 
I'm not expecting the blue team to really know what's going on, if there even is a blue team. And that's just that's just typical. Now, sometimes you have really good teams, but most of the time you don't. And I think a lot of the people who are having this conversation or here with us in B-Sides might not actually quite realize what it looks like in the real world. Because most of us with an information security role work at some organization that has an information security function. And that might be on the offensive side. Maybe you work for a company like Open Security and we do cybersecurity services. Or perhaps it's on the defensive side or even offensive side, but internal to an organization where that organization itself has invested into cybersecurity positions. So if we work in the business of cybersecurity, we're actually already exposed to something that is not normal. And as somebody who's done a fair bit of incident response, I can tell you what normal looks like because I show up when their network uh, stops working. And in those cases, many times they might have some IT personnel, but they probably don't have direct information security people. And that's not because if they had them, they certainly wouldn't have get ha gotten hacked or anything like that. I'm just saying we need to look at the world as a whole. And there's a very, very big difference between the top 20% of companies and the bottom 80% of companies out there. In the top 20%, there may be somebody who fulfills an information security role in the company specifically. In the bottom 80% of companies, and yes, I seriously do mean 80% of companies today, and I'm not even talking about, say, companies in uh, less developed countries. No, I'm talking about the companies that we see and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the, 80% of those, 80% of those companies, they don't have a single employee with an information uh, security specific function. Now we are talking about pretty big companies here, companies that may have say 200 to 1,000 employees. So we're not talking about the tiny companies, but we are talking about the majority of companies. And as a result, in information security, we're often inundated in this uh, circumstances of isolation where our perspective is significantly skewed from reality. Because we look at things from the perspective of organizations where we work or whom we work for, which means that they have likely made some investment into cybersecurity. And I'm here to tell you right now, that is not the typical. And so what it looks like from the attack perspective in many of these cases, and also for that top 20%, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. But what it looks like from the attack perspective is that you don't need to do very much at all to be covert. Right. So if we're talking about covert, the idea with covert operations is that these are actions that we maybe do from an offensive perspective that are intended to fly beneath the radar. Now, is it possible that it wasn't covert enough? Yes, 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 absolutely. But when we're doing an operation, right, as an attacker, we make a decision. That decision that we make is covert if what we expect is for it to fly beneath the radar. Now, we could get caught again. That does happen. But our thoughts there are, I'm going to do something, and this will probably not get noticed. And if we look at the bottom 80%, that is 100% true. It's like uh, uh, um, that Anchorman uh, thing, right? 80% of the time it works, 80, uh, 100, it works all the time. Yeah, that's what it is for the bottom 80%. Now, in the top 20%, we can often do covert operations without doing much either. So we look at the, eight, the bottom 80% of the top 20%. Now I sound like Bernie Sanders over here. Goodness. <laughs> the bottom 80% of the top 20%. Yeah, so the bottom 80% of the top 20%, we generally uh, are operating in an environment where there maybe is investment in security, but there isn't really continuous and active defense or monitoring. So what we might do is we might trip some kind of antivirus or EDR. EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. Uh, so we trip that system, but uh, when it finds our malware, maybe we, uh, we work through our malware a little bit more and we do a bypass and now we get our malware actually working. But when we do this, we probably don't expect that anyone actually looked at the detection or at the antivirus alert and did anything about it. Because the bottom 80% of the top 20% maybe has some of these things in place and they have the opportunity to be uh, victorious, but they don't actually take advantage of that. So they have the sensors, but nobody's looking at them. Uh, here's a really sad example of exactly that. For example, Equifax. Who here has heard of Equifax? Yeah, that's a sad story, or actually just an embarrassing story, right? They get compromised by an attack group who had compromised them two separate occasions in the past, going after the exact same data, and they still managed to fall apart a third time. Then they took an extra four months after they found the compromise before they told anybody about it because they just don't care about the fact that they just released 200 plus million people's credit card information and data, like absolutely atrocious. Really want that company to burn in a fire. Um, but what's fun or fun, 
What's intriguing is if we look at how they found out that they were actually compromised. Like if we look at the TTP of that attack group, they were not particularly effective. They didn't really know what they were doing. Um, and we can see this by some of the commands that they ran. For example, every time they compromised this Equifax server, the first command that they would run is who am I? Because they wanted to know what the user context is that they were running in. Okay. Theoretically, you could know this based on the process that you're compromising. In that case, it was a Java web application, so it was a Tomcat server. Tomcat generally runs as root on these systems, which in my opinion is just a design flaw. Um, but so the attacker gets, gets access to these systems and starts running some basic commands on them. Now, Equifax found out months and months after they were compromised because they had a monitoring solution and the monitoring solution identified data exfiltration. So why did it take four or five months for them to see, for them to identify that they were compromised when that compromise was happening and the data exfiltration was happening over that entire period of time? Well, so it turns out they had this box they probably paid too much money for and they plugged it in and it was doing this continuous monitoring and the blinky blinky lights were going blinky 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 but nobody was looking until five months later they realized that it wasn't properly logging i think what happened was that the hard drive had gotten full of logs and they didn't clear it so it was going blinky 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 and they weren't thinking about the fact that it wasn't working at all as so they finally get this thing back up and running and they go oh huh i think we're hacked Again, this is covert operations in the bottom 80% of the top 20%. You don't have to do very much because even if the security orchestration is in place for 80% of that top 20%, they're not looking at it. So what we're really talking about is the top 20% of the top 20%. I think that mathematically makes sense. <laughs> But we're talking about advanced red team. We need to have the ability to project forces, right? To be able to operate on these environments, even when they're some of the most secure ones out there. And for a couple of information security firms, that's really what we focus on. So uh, if I were to name the, the ones that really focus here, it's say Trusted Sec, Black Hills Information Security, Us Open Security, Red Siege, they're a company out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, our focus tends to really be on operating in some of the most well-orchestrated environments from a security standpoint out there. We really love to play in these playgrounds. But what we'll see here is that those type of organizations have all done some interesting things from the perspective of retooling in order for it to be possible to do operations on those environments. Because if we do anything that is even remotely not covert enough, <laughs> we get caught immediately. And then the entire campaign uh, falls apart pretty darn quickly. And so if we're in this circumstance where we have to tiptoe around the environment very, very cautiously, and then we end up in a circumstance, like let's say we see a system, we've got system access to that device, and we know a domain admin is logged in, so we want to do some kind of mimicast, but we're pretty sure that something may be looking for, let's say, reflective DLL injection into the LSAS process, right? We're pretty sure that this operation that we're going to do isn't covert, it's going to be overt, but we need to do it anyways. Because if we don't, we may not be able to accomplish our objectives from a red team engagement perspective. So every now and then we have what we call non-opsec safe operations we may do as a red team, where we're aware that this is going to be less covert than the rest of our operations, and it's going to be more loud. So it's, there's a chance we might get caught. And so what we're talking about with overt operations here is when we do an action that we know or acknowledge the blue team should see. Now it's possible they don't see it. Happens all the time, right? Hiding in the noise is an example of this, but we acknowledge that this operation we're about to do could uh, key the blue team in on what we're absolutely doing. Now, the thing about overt operations, though, is what if we acknowledge that we're going to be seen and we make ourselves seen everywhere simultaneously in order to cover what we're actually doing? So with blue team defenses these days, there's actually this real big uh, conversation about using cyberspace deception in order to build deceptive defensive systems that trick the bad guy into giving up information about themselves. Uh, an example of a cyberspace trap like this might be if we set a fine-grained password policy in Active Directory with a lockout policy of one, and then we create a uh, domain admin user for that uh, uh, for that. Um, we, cre we create a real domain admin user with a strong password that we never need to use. We can throw that password away. Uh, we just needed the admin account. Okay. And we set that admin account to that lockout policy of one. And then we put incorrect credentials into LSAS memory on some systems. You can do this with a run as command. 
if an attacker runs Mimikatz, which is one of the most common techniques that attackers will use, they'll get that domain admin account and a password for it. But when they try that password, it's not the correct password. So since the lockout policy is one, it'll lock out the account and the attack or the defender can see that that system has been compromised based on that account lockout. So this cyberspace deception is presenting the attacker with something that they're actively looking for, but that thing that they're looking for is actually a trap. Um, for example, if you look at, say, monkey traps, they do the ones with the, the jar that's, that the hole is large enough to get your hand in, uh, but there's marbles in it. The monkeys want to grab the marbles. But so they grab a fistful of marbles and they can't get their hand out of the jar anymore. So you're giving them the marbles that they want, uh, domain admin credentials, uh, except they're not even real domain admin credentials, and you're trapping them based on the TTP that the attackers themselves actually use. And this is an emerging defensive strategy for some of the top tier uh, organizations out there. I was in fact doing some of this uh, cyber defense, uh, cyberspace trapping orchestration and design uh, when I was in the military as part of the US Air Force's tactics development shop. Uh, but it's really, really cool. The thing is, from the offensive perspective, we've never really needed to trick the blue team very heavily into doing something because we've been able to operate covertly thus far. But if we're looking at some of the most secure environments on the planet, well, what we have to acknowledge is that most of the covert operations we would have done in the past for this security uh, uh, posture of this organization are actually going to be overt operations instead of covert ones. So how can we potentially leverage, leverage deception and overtly perform deception on the environment when we know, A, the attacker is or the defender is going to see us, so we want to be give ourselves more opportunity and more freedom of maneuver in the environment by convincing the defenders that we are somewhere else and doing something that we are in fact not worried about and so let's talk about this history then of overt to covert operations here with covert operations in cybersecurity at the very beginning of course you could do whatever the heck you wanted to do because we didn't have antivirus and uh, for the gray beards among us you may recognize some of these screenshots here we have sub seven Sub7 is essentially the OG, original gangster of uh, remote access trojans or remote access tools. Uh, Sub7 is just a backdoor implant framework, right? You can create the backdoor, it connects back to Sub7. The screenshot that's in front of it is one called Poison Ivy. This is one that was used by a uh, Chinese intrusion set, but unfortunately for them, they, uh, they uploaded their code to a place that everyone in the world had access to. And so now the world has access to this backdoor system as well. To be fair, these are quite old. Sub-7 is uh, late 90s. Poison Ivy is early 2000s. But the thing is, these, these backdoors, these implants, they should get picked up by traditional antivirus because they don't really change. It's not polymorphic in any sense. Because once upon a time, those kinds of defenses didn't exist. And to be covert, we didn't have to do anything, anything at all. And then we have things like the Metasploit framework. Metasploit framework came out also in the early 2000s, but it's continued to grow and was developed and built upon by the community over time uh, and heavily. Metasploit's absolutely outstanding. It is, however, an exploit. It is an exploitation framework, which includes things like exploit development. So in the modern sense, we don't traditionally think about uh, Metasploit as a command and control framework. It does happen to be a C2 tool, uh, but what we'll see with some more advanced ones are that there's a lot more command and control framework features uh, that don't actually exist in Metasploit. But what we do start to see in the Metasploit project is some understanding that there are signatures and that we may need to do things to evade those signatures. And with that, we have things like the encoders inside of Metasploit. For example, one of the ones that's uh, pretty well known is called Shikataganai, which is Japanese for it is inevitable. Um, and so what it does is it takes a binary and it changes that one. So it might say, hey, look, we've got um, this x86 piece of assembly that does something. So let's convert that to an operation that does the equivalent thing, but with different codes. For example, if we say, um, um, if we're putting things in a register for say, registers for adding, let's say we say uh, set EAX to one, set EAB to uh, uh, two, and then add them together. Uh, or to one and then add them together it gives you two right but you could do this in the opposite manner you could say add a to b and then add b to c and then subtract d from c and then you still get two and so here we have an example of just equivalent operations that then take uh, a binary and make it do the same thing but do it 
in a different set of instructions, which significantly alters the signature for that actual um, uh, binary. Now, of course, when you have an encoder like this, what you have the ability to do as an antivirus vendor is you can look at that encoder, since Metasploit's encoders are open source, you can look at that encoder and you can build a signature for how that encoder changes binaries. For example, uh, if you were to do something like this with calculator.exe, calculator.exe will absolutely show up as a virus in most antivirus uh, uh, software because it's not actually looking for the executable, it's looking for the encoder. Um, I, in fact, in 2013, 2014, uh, built an encoder, and that encoder, I, I still happen to have the code, works to this day for Metasploit um, interpreters, like to this day. And the only reason it does is because um, I never uploaded the encoder to um, open source on the internet. And so antivirus vendors have never had the opportunity to get the source code for the encoder. And as a result, I can still use it today to um, modify shell code and bypass antivirus vendors. Because antivirus itself isn't particularly a good security mechanism. And I know a lot of people get a bit fatalistic about this because they say, you know, what am I actually supposed to do if all of these solutions that I can acquire or orchestrate on my network can be bypassed? But the thing is, we're actually looking at this wrong. And the reason we're looking at it wrong is because we always want this staples easy button, right? Antivirus is a good example of a staples easy button. And it works pretty well if we're talking about a mass um, uh, exposed worm, like let's say WannaCry. So then they have plenty of time to build signatures for the virus before it actually manages to get to a lot of systems. Will some be, ex be uh, exposed? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like building a vaccine, right? Once we see a new strain of, say, WannaCry, the antivirus vendors go out and they make a signature for it, but they can't make that signature until they've seen that version of WannaCry come out. So they actually have to have exposure of a certain number of people. Then they find it, they build the signature, and uh, make herd immunity, essentially, from everyone else who happens to have that antivirus product. But the thing is, that means that if you're doing operations as a human red teamer, you will never be caught by these antivirus signatures because everything you're doing is from the perspective of antivirus, zero day, always, right? If I build my own back door, is there a signature for it? No. If I use that back door for a specific campaign, will there become a signature for it? Probably not. Not until that thing gets exposed and there's incident response that happens and the incident responders give that the, anti the, the virus data to an antivirus vendor to create it. See, the thing is, a automated system like antivirus is never, ever, ever going to be significantly capable at detecting a human operator on an environment. I, as a human operator, will inevitably be successful at overcoming these machines. Now, I do hear sometimes this concept of uh, artificial intelligence-based and machine learning-based cybersecurity, um, and you can buy those things today, and they don't actually do what they say they do, and they're complete garbage, save your money. But I do think that at some point in the future, maybe 15, 20 years in the future, we will have uh, perhaps not general purpose artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence that's flexible enough from a cybersecurity context that it actually has some ability to fight an interactive operator. But if you think that that's something that's available today, you are misinformed. Um, and the sales team of that product has most likely been lying to you because it just doesn't exist today, which means to stop a human attacker you need to have a human defender. And we absolutely, absolutely can be effective in this manner. But what it means is the blue team tools that are effective at stopping human attackers tend to be tools that emphasize the blue team operator themselves, as in they make them more efficient, more capable of detecting and responding so that they can identify where the complex is and identify what's going on with the, uh, with the system and the environment and then uh, eradicate the compromise as well. So if no one's looking, from a covert operations perspective, we don't really need to be that covert. But the thing is, um, but the thing is, today, for the best environments, there's often actually real defenders who are taking these, say, antivirus logs or EDR alerts, and they're actually sending a human there to take a look at what the circumstances are whereby that was generated. If nobody's looking at these logs, everything is covert. But today, for some of the most secure enterprises, your endpoint detection and response systems are actually being used by blue teams to do detection 
and response. I know it's a revolutionary concept, right? It's so fascinating. You see things like, uh, say, uh, Carbon Black or Endgame, and an organization buys these things, and they're endpoint detection and response capabilities. But while these organizations put them on their endpoints, they never use them to detect. And after that thing detects, they never actually respond to what's been detected. I mean, it's literally in the name. But so for our more advanced defenders, they are actually using these tools the way that they can be most effective in enabling them to have um, uh, situational awareness of what's going on on their environment itself. And so as a result, attackers, red teamers like myself, we've had to change the game. Because if I'm using Metasploit and it triggers antivirus, I, can't no, I can no longer rely on nobody going there to actually look at what's happening. Plus, these antivirus vendors may have actually created, or these not necessarily just antivirus vendors, but these endpoint detection response vendors have created so many uh, trigger opportunities that while they might not block my malware, they will almost certainly alert at some degree of severity the blue team to come look because something doesn't look right, right? And this is what why EDR is so different fundamentally than antivirus because antivirus is there to block bad stuff. And we already know it's terrible at doing that. But EDR isn't actually there to block stuff. In fact, most EDR vendors happen to have signatures for malware, but that's because the people purchasing them, the organizations purchasing those products, expect them to block bad stuff, which is fundamentally dumb. Like that is not what they are there for. That is not what we need as blue teams. Uh, let antivirus do antivirus stuff. The thing that you want with EDR is the ability to detect and respond as efficiently as possible as an active defensive blue team. And uh, so while these features do often exist in EDR products, what we really need to focus on is that blue team life cycle around detection and response. And as a result of that, any of the major cybersecurity uh, services firms like Open Security, Trusted Sec, um, Red Siege, Black Hills, list goes on, uh, in Guardians, we've all had to go out and develop our own custom command and control tools and malware. Some have released those tools to the public. Other tools are uh, closed source and we're maintaining them in-house because we need to continue to be able to do operations and we need to overcome the fact that many of these vendors are literally watching our projects on, uh, on GitHub and immediately creating signatures the moment we push something uh, to them. Whereas if we just didn't push those signatures, we would never ever get caught. For example, uh, Prismatica here is the uh, C2 framework that's created by my company, Open Security. And there's some remote, uh, remote backdoors and such in there as well. Uh, that one is, though, uh, open source and free and on the internet. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit um, as well. But so what we see here is that it's actually become a bit of a golden age of C2 because defenses uh, have had so much investment put into them. I believe information security this year, or maybe, no, last year was a $70 billion industry. Like, wow. But the thing is that. Uh, that market capitalization is all on the defensive side. So like uh, McAfee was bought out several years ago by Intel for $1.2 billion or something absurd like that, uh, which means that as red teamers, what we're actually doing is we're operating and competing and trying to overcome products that have billions and billions of dollars invested in them. And so open source projects are just not going to be able to compete on that level. So in that context, what do we do? Well, the first thing that we saw the information security community, the red team community do, is just start releasing massive amounts of new C2 tools. It's really a golden age of C2. And what you see here is actually something called the C2 matrix. The C2 matrix is a, a, a web app that's created by uh, George Ochies. He's actually the author of the Security 564 and 565 classes with SANS on red teaming. And so this project here goes through a bunch of different C2 toolkits and helps you decide which ones are possibly best for your organization to use. So we see here a bunch of them on the left-hand side. We can actually go through this wizard and ask the, uh, the matrix for um, what is probably possibly gonna be the best utility for us to use in our actual uh, red team organization. So we could do something like, do we need this to have an exposed API? Uh, does our C2 framework need to support multiple users? Okay, next. What kind of channels do we want it to be able to communicate over? Uh, does it need to be able to operate on different operating systems? Well, maybe we want all three. Uh, I'll tell you that most of these C2 tools focus on Windows for a good reason. Active Directory Domain is where most of our 
uh, engagements rely on. Uh, some of them do have Linux support, but not a huge number have Mac OS support. Interesting. Uh, what are the capabilities do we need? Maybe we want to have custom profiles on the actual network. This is going to be really important for our conversation on overt operations here in just a little bit. Because here we're talking about features that a C2 framework has in order to make it more covert. We talk about overt operations. We actually may want to be louder. We'll look at what that seems like in just a moment. Uh, so we say it needs to have the ability to have custom C2 profiles. That allows us to control how it communicates over the internet. Let's say we're using HTTP communication. With a custom C2 profile, we get to set things like uh, what the get parameters are going to be in the get request and what the server is going to respond back with. So on both sides, you can maybe make the communication look exactly like it's AWS or Google Docs or something like that. Um, I'll just keep going. What kind of uh, interface does it need to have? Maybe we want to have a GUI or a web interface. Uh, maybe CLI is good enough for us, but maybe we want to have some kind of UI. Most of the advanced C2 frameworks these days are starting to have a UI, which I do feel like is important. It can have some efficiency improvements there, but most importantly, it's a lot easier to get multifaceted people together to form a red team if there's some kind of cohesive UI that can be shared. Um, and then what kind of support? Uh, let's say we don't care about support too much. And it lists us here the C2 framework tools that are potentially going to support our needs. Um, and Prismatic is one of them. That tool is up here. Um, it's got an API and such. And you're, you're welcome to take a look at it if you'd like to. Um, it's a product that's supported by Open Security. And it's open source and free. We're continuously developing it over time. And there, you see that. All right, so in the end, blue team capabilities are, are very, very heavily on the rise at the moment. As in blue teams are getting better, better, better day by day. But I still see this all the time. Um, Anthony Coggins here tweeted this at me um, when I was talking about overt operations on Twitter. And he said, as a blue team member, and I've heard this so many times from so many people, but he says, as a blue team member, we, I always say we have to get it right 100% of the time. Red team only needs to get lucky once. And the thing is, he is wrong. He is really, really wrong. But his position is not unique. So many blue teamers have this fatalistic point of view, and they say, I'm going to lose my job at some point. I've already made my peace with that because an attacker is going to get in, and there you go. And you know, if all of your users on your environment are local administrators, then yeah, that's probably, you've probably just given up the, the, uh, the ghost at that point. But the thing is, Let's think about what an attacker has to do and where they have to be successful. They have to craft some kind of phishing ruse, most likely, if they're going phishing to get in, which is the most common way attackers get access to networks. So they craft some phishing ruse, and uh, they send that phishing email to somebody, and a user clicks on it. Will they eventually get a user to click on something? Yeah, yeah, they will. Now, once that user clicks on something, they need to uh, that, that click needs to cause code execution so the attacker can have remote, remote access. Will that work eventually? Sure, sure, it might. Uh, do we have any detection controls on that? I hope we have some, some for things that are getting executed and post-exploitation as well. Now what? Now the attacker has access as a standard, regular user in the domain. Do they start their ransomware campaign? No, of course not. Um, I was doing last year a uh, incident response for an organization that was ransomware. Uh, the attackers asked for uh, like $2.2 million dollars. Um, via Bitcoin to extort them for their network back. They ended up negotiating the uh, the actual ransomware fee down to $1.4 million, which is still obscene. But the reason they had to pay is because they had, uh, the company was making about $40 million uh, in gross revenue year over year. And uh, if they said no, they would have had to fire all of their employees and they would have gone out of business because the attacker had everything. They had all of their source code, they had all of their workstations, all of their servers, it was full compromise. They got massacred. And uh, so the, the question was, pay $1.4 million or go out of business? That's a pretty easy question for them to answer in that case. And so what we have to realize, though, is what were the circumstances that caused that to happen? Well, their network was not particularly secure by any means, and they had a lot of local administrators in all of their systems. But in spite of that, and, and their domain controller was vulnerable to the eternal blue exploit. Let me throw that one out there, too. <laughs> but in spite of all of that, the attackers got into the environment in November, December, and then they launched their ransomware attack in April. End of April, in fact. It was almost May. 
That's eight months of opportunity to detect and then to respond. And if the attacker at any point alerts you to their presence, allows for that detection to happen, well, then you, you get to respond. That's a really big home field advantage the blue team has. And if we're actually looking to identify TTP that attackers do, and we're looking to discover them in a post-exploitation context, every single action the attackers take, every single command that they run is an opportunity to detect. For that same organization, we did for them a, uh, a culminating exercise. So we, we helped eradicate the compromise. We helped train their team. We helped them orchestrate better defense controls and do uh, active de detection and active defense on their network. And then we finalized the whole thing in February of this year uh, with an on-site red team where uh, my red team was compromising their environment and I was embedded with the blue team there doing, say, a purple team operations where the red team is trying to attack and then we're defending and they were exceptionally successful against uh, against even my red teamers. So w w I'm not particularly worried about this happening to them again in the future. And the reason for it is blue teams have this fatalistic perspective where they think they're going to lose, and by thinking it, they make it so. When it comes down to it, blue team does have the home field advantage. And as red teamers, if we're operating on the most well-orchestrated blue team environments, we have our work cut out for us really, really heavily. And so the thing about that is, if let's say we're doing a red team and we're using a tool like Cobalt Strike, and the Cobalt Strike binary that we're using as a remote access tool gets picked up by antivirus and we lose to blue team, it can be really, really frustrating because, well, what are we going to do about it? I can't buy a tool that an antivirus vendor can't also buy and make signatures for. So we just, we're in this weird place where we're doing all kinds of operations that we know an attacker would do and would bypass the blue team. But because we've got certain requirements in red team, let's say using commercial off the self tools or open source tools, we know that we are being louder than the actual, the, the actual um, attack groups might be who have this $1.4 million to potentially gain off of a compromise like this. And so that can be really frustrating when you feel like you got caught and the blue team won and the reason why they won is not fair because it wasn't realistic or contrived or there wasn't enough network traffic going on. It's just not fair, right? Well, we have to resist that urge. We really, really do. Because red team is all about making the blue team better. And so if they catch our stuff, that's outstanding. Now, if we identify that they need to be better because they wouldn't catch something realistic, we may want to do what's called a white card and say, okay, you caught this, keep looking for another way that you could catch this. Let that one go and pretend that you're not seeing that. Let's threshold that for a little while. See what else you can detect. So we can do those kind of things. But the other way we may consider this is if the blue team can see everything because their orchestration is really good, what if instead of trying to go more covert so that there's less for them to see, what if we do the opposite and we go really, really overt so that when they look at their network, it looks like their network has exploded. It looks like the attacker is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And if it looks like we're everywhere, what can the blue team possibly do to detect or respond to the very specific place and specific actions that we actually want to accomplish? We're talking here about creating some kind of fog of war effect so that the defenders see all of this action going on in their network, but don't have the ability to respond to what we're actually doing. Here's an example of a little bit something like that. This is uh, me teaching at the uh, TBT 570 class we do with SANS, which is Red Force versus Blue Force, where I play the red team, and then uh, the students are all different groups of the blue team, and they have to defend this environment against an attack campaign. This is uh, campaign B, I think. Um, and if you notice here, that's Cobalt Strike uh, as, a, as a screenshot behind the scenes, and all of their systems are beaconing out to me. But am I doing operations on all of them simultaneously? Or is the tool on the left-hand side, which is not Cobalt Strike, the actual remote access tool that I'm using in order to compromise the environment and accomplish my objectives, where Cobalt Strike exists just to get them focused on it? Because Cobalt Strike is a little bit louder, there are signatures for it, if you something like Endgame, it might really focus in on Cobalt Strike. So while they're spinning their wheels, focusing on all of these loud signatures, that sure could potentially be bad, we're actually accomplishing our, our operations, our covert operations, external to the overt noise that we're creating 
inside the environment. And so if we want to orchestrate an attack campaign in this context, we have to reverse engineer the blue team. And the blue team essentially does detection and then response. And on the detection side, the way that we tend to operate in order to avoid detection or to operate in the detection window of blue team is we try to be more and more covert. Or alternatively, something we're not going to talk about today, uh, but alternatively, we could attack the blue team defenses to, um, to disrupt their detection capability. For example, if I'm trying to do really hardcore covert operations and I get onto a system, one of the first things I'll probably do is kill Splunk D.exe if they're using Splunk as their SIM, because now suddenly that system is no longer responding and then we'll do whatever operations we want and then probably turn Splunk back on so that they can't tell that, they're, that the system is actually down and has stopped responding. So it looks like the system started responding again and now it's just missing the logs that were potentially uh, at risk. So we can attack their network defenses as well. And there are a large number of things you can do to attack network defenses. Uh, for example, with EDR products, if you use local firewalls or uh, ARP, ta ARP cache tables, you can prevent the EDRs from communicating with the actual uh, endpoints. And if they can't communicate with the endpoints, they can't alert the defensive team either. So there's actually a lot that you can do from the perspective of attacking network defenses and network controls as the red team in order to degrade the blue team's detection capability. And so if we're operating in the detection, uh, the counter detection uh, standpoint of things, there are some things we can do. Now on the response thing, like they've found us at this point and they want to respond, there's a couple of things we can do as well. Because the thing is, with detection and response, that cycle for the blue team, their objective as a blue team is to detect the attack and respond to the attack before the attacker delivers effects. Like let's say the ransomware. For example, that company that I gave as an example here, where they were ransomed for $1.4 million, if they had responded at any point before the ransomware hit, it's no big deal, right? It's either $1.4 million or nothing. Because if they can respond before the effect gets delivered, it doesn't matter that they were compromised. This is another thing that blue teams don't realize. It doesn't matter that you're compromised. What matters is that you can respond before the attacker delivers their effect, be it ransomware, be it data theft, whatever it might be. And so as the attacker, if we want to be successful during the response, we can hack faster. So if they've detected us and they're in the process of responding, but we are able to be uh, more efficient or to speed through the network and deliver our effects faster than the blue team is able to respond, then we still win. Okay. Now, alternatively, what about the blue team's resources? What if we give them more to respond to? See, the thing is, attackers have been doing all kinds of denial of service attacks for eons and eons and eons. And by eons, I mean computers have been around for eons, right? <laughs> so attackers have been doing these kinds of attacks, like sin flood attacks, right? Sin flood is a denial of service attack. Generally, it's a distributed denial of service attack. You're doing it from multiple different hosts. But the objective there is to exhaust all of the resources for that remote host, generally a website or something, right? So if it's a website and we're doing a sin flood attack because we're anonymous and anonymous has just come back, uh, okay? And so they're doing this sin flood attack. What is their objective? They don't really hack into the box. All they're doing is uh, overutilizing all of the resources that are available to that system and now the system is no longer available. But we have to think of blue team itself as a resource because if we can exhaust all of the blue team's resources, then we've essentially done a denial of service attack against the blue team themselves. And this is what we're talking about. When we talk about overt operations. As so we look at overt operations and we look at the covert to overt continuum, we can, of course, if we want to be more covert, we can slow things down. If we want to uh, stay underneath weeds, we can do that targeting of network detection controls and attack those. More overt is to hack faster, right? We're going to be louder. We acknowledge that these are overt operations, but what we're taking a gamble into is we are gambling that we're going to be able to hack fast enough to hack faster than they can respond. And then finally, with blue team resource exhaustion, we are being very overt because our objective there is to give them so much to respond to, really overt, that they can't actually respond to the things that matter the most. Um, and so if we look at the timeline here, we can compress or stretch these different components of the blue team's detection and response capability. And so all of the operations that we as red team perform within this continuum, their objective is to either stretch that detection or response window or 
to compress our operations into that window such they fit within it. And so if we want to target the blue team directly, we have to think about how they do operations. So we need to break down and deconstruct their security operations center in order to do things like uh, um, identify what we want to do to resource to exhaust the resources. For example, most organizations have a host team and they have a network team. And if we're exhausting the network team, but we haven't done the host team, then we might actually still be losing. So we want to deconstruct their actual operations and then perform exhaustion attacks against all of those components. So for example, we might go back to exactly what we talked about with the C2 tools, right? We wanted to find for a covert operation C2 framework, a C2 framework that lets us do custom profiles. Well, what if you do the Cobalt Strike default profile? Most intrusion detection systems, well, I hope all of them, but most intrusion detection systems will trigger an alert that says C2 tool detected if you're running Cobalt Strike in default modes. So generally speaking, as an attacker, we're thinking about covert. So we want to modify everything and do everything custom. But what if we just take Cobalt Strike and we plant it on all of the systems in the environment? And we don't even care if they find the C2 servers because we're not using them. The only thing we care about is your IDS is telling you that there's outbound attack traffic from your environment. Go look at hosts one through 5,000 because they're all doing it. Um, we don't want to be slow here, right? So if we're looking at overt to covert continuum, instead of hacking slow, we want to hack faster or at least make it appear like we're hacking faster. So we want to have these beacon intervals be really, really loud. What you see on the right hand side is a tool called AI Hunter, which is really good at discovering beaconing based malware. Uh, we want to make it really easy to discover in AI Hunter because we want not to hide in the noise. We want to create noise to actually hide ourselves in. So it looks like all of our outbound stuff is beaconing really rapidly. Um, we can also spoof these. This is actually really, really, really cool. Um, when people first get information security, they're like, oh, yeah, you can spoof your IP. Uh, but when it comes down to it, that's not exactly true, because if we're looking at a protocol like TCP, TCP is connection oriented, right? It's stateful. So you send a SYN packet in, you get a SYN act, um, uh, and then you acknowledge that you receive that SYN act, and now you've established through a handshake, and then you can send data via like push, push, push messages and so on. Okay. This means that you have to track that session state, which is done by the sequence numbers in TCP. So you can't actually spoof your IP address because when the target system responds to that spoofed message, the system that received it needs to, or it's going to have to respond with the sequence numbers that are calculated based on the first sin it received, and it will only accept that final act if the sequence numbers match as well. So you actually need to understand both sides. But the thing is, if we're doing um, attack operations, we can spoof both sides because we can fake both of them. So we can spoof from inside the environment and then spoof the responses that come back in them from wherever we would like. So let's say I have a C2 IP address that's on Azure. I can spoof any IP address response on the outside as well as the inside. So let's say on the inside, I've got my little spoofing tool and maybe I'm using escape before it and I send a send packet out to an IP address on the internet that doesn't have a host that's up. Just any random IP address, okay. Now on my Azure side, right, the one that is really my C2 tool, I can spoof a response because I actually know what the sequence numbers are from the original SYN message. And the SYN message is going to receive that and it's going to be able to send back that act. So we can actually spoof all sides of this. The thing is we won't actually get the results of the traffic, but if we're doing overt operations, we don't care about the results of the traffic. So this isn't real C2. This just looks for all intents and purposes like real C2, which means we can make it look like your environment is being compromised by hundreds of thousands of remote C2 servers simultaneously by spoofing both sides of the communication really, really quickly and easy in your environment. And so on the network side, most organizations, they tend to be very, very network focused in their defensive strategies. And on the network side, they're gonna wanna put in firewall rules, but they can't put in firewall rules for the entire internet. And if we spoof to make it look like the C2 addresses are every host in the entire internet, well, their network team is immediately compromised and their resources are exhausted. So our real C2 is now much more effective because they can no longer detect and respond to it because their, use or their resources are now overutilized. Here's an example of one of the tools that they might use to do some of this detection. This here is uh, ElkStack. This is actually via the security onion version. And so the network team may be relying on something like this. 
our objective is to fill this with bogus information such that the actual attack information that we're looking for is no longer easily discernible because it's full of all kinds of other things that look like really bad attacks that need to be responded to. And so the other side of that is going to be host operations. They might be using, say, uh, Splunk senders to get host event logs. They might be using something like, say, uh, Silence. So here we see host logs, Silence, CrowdStrike, EDRs. We want to fill the logs of all of these systems as well in order to cause overutilization of the host. So that means if we want to make everyone think that we ran Mimikatz on a system so that they have to respond to that, we don't actually need to run Mimikatz. All we need to do is create an event log that makes it look like we ran Mimikatz because then in their sim, their sim is going to tell them they ran Mimikatz because those log forwarders, they're not actually looking for techniques that are being executed. They're reading the logs and those logs have been constructed such that the blue team will have good uh, indicators of compromise to look like look at. So what we need to do is identify what those indicators of compromise are going to be, and then we need to fill the logs on all of the systems with that. It turns out that PowerShell is extremely good for this. And with PowerShell, we can use the get event, uh, or not get, uh, create event logs um, commandlet in order to accomplish this. Uh, let, me, let me pull this up for you so you can see an example. It doesn't want to work the way that I intend it to, so we're just going to cheat it. So if we were to jump to something like a Windows machine here and open something like PowerShell, Copy and pasting is hard today. All right, we'll just open up a text editor and slap it in a text editor. So you could run a commandlet like this. Here's a real quick one-liner, and all it does is add um, uh, a new event log where the event source is mimicats.exe. And if you're building a, uh, a detection, Holy macro computer. If you're building some kind of detection where that detection is um, uh, looking for certain strings that are known to be bad, like Mimikatz, Mimikatz is a really common one to have some kind of detection built around. We've essentially just created event logs that allow us to create that in the event log. And since the, get, the new event log commandlet in PowerShell actually lets you run it against remote computers, we can have access to a single computer in the environment and run this against all of the computers in the environment to make it look like Mimikatz has been simultaneously run on every single system local to that actual system. So we can absolutely control what the actual uh, defenders get to see in the environment. And if we can control that, we can make it look like something like this, this is Mimikatz, is being executed everywhere. And so now that they have detected it everywhere, they need to respond to it everywhere and can't respond to what really matters. Where else might we find some of these things to use as detections? The Living Off Land Binaries and Script Project has a list of those. Defenders today often go through these lolbazes in order to build detections in Splunk or in Elk to, to determine whether or not an attacker has run something. So if we go through here, we have now a list of things to make our covert operation scripts do. And of course, the attackers or the defenders know all about different languages and such that are being used. So if we're using something like PowerShell and PowerSploit, all of these things are 
malicious in nature. And so if we make it look like that has been executed somewhere, or we actually just drop it and run it somewhere, but we do this ad nauseum to hundreds of systems, that's all more noise the detent defender has to respond to. And so what we're doing here is essentially reverse deceptive operations, where the defender may want to deceive us to make us uh, vulnerable or susceptible to a trap. We can also trap the defenders here too, make them think that the attack is happening um, in their finance department. We're actually focused on getting data from HR or whatever it might actually be. And we can absolutely uh, take advantage of Sun Tzu style techniques here. Now, if you're interested in things like cyberspace deception, there is a podcast that's called the Take Back the Advantage podcast by Kevin Fiscus. It's a full YouTube channel. Um, it's really, really good, actually. Um, I was, in fact, on a podcast with Kevin Fiscus a couple of weeks back, and all these videos are up there. Um, really interesting way to make your mind think differently about cybersecurity than perhaps it has in the past. Um, here's my contact information. If you have questions that come out at some point in the future and you want to reach out or you want to jam about red teaming and uh, uh, cyberspace trapping and deception and all those kind of things, I'm totally into it. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so that's probably your best bet to look, up, look me up. I also have a YouTube channel and I do videos on these kinds of things all of the time. Hi, Matt. It's John. We're right up at the end of our time here, but there's actually a great conversation going on in the Discord right now. Uh, we're going to move that to track four breakout. So if you'd like to jump on there at the end of this, uh, there's tons of questions and there's some uh, back and forth that I think that uh, you can definitely help out with. Thank you. Perfect. I'll jump on Discord and we'll chat it up. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for your time. I hope this was uh, interesting for you.